Hey guys, and welcome back to this episode of Curious Scientist. In this episode, we'll take a look at the confinement energy of a particle, and how this impacts upon the Bohr radius. First, let's look at the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. This says that the uncertainty in the position of a particle, or delta x, times by the uncertainty in its momentum, or delta p, has got to be greater than h bar over 2. Now this is the actual Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, but something which we can note here is that the precise factor of a half is not necessarily required. What this equation tells us is the order of the uncertainty in these two values. So for the purposes of this video, we're actually going to cheat a bit and forget about this factor of a half. This means that we can rewrite the Heisenberg uncertainty principle as follows. Delta x times by delta p is bigger than h bar. We can rearrange this to give the following. Delta p is bigger than h bar upon delta x. Now if we take a look at the kinetic energy of a particle, which we can call k, k is equal to half mv squared. But we want this in terms of momentum, so we can apply the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle to it. So k is equal to p squared upon 2m. And let's say, for the sake of argument, that p is equal to delta p. In a sense, this argument is valid, because if we don't know what the momentum could be, it could well be the maximum value in that uncertainty. So this gives the quantum mechanical representation of the kinetic energy. So quantum mechanics gives that k is equal to delta p squared upon 2m. But we already have a term for delta p. Delta p must be bigger than h bar upon delta x. And we can substitute this in, in the strict limit where delta p is equal to h bar upon delta x. This gives the following. k equals h bar squared upon 2m delta x squared. Now, if we relabel delta x and call it a, for example, now this equation is profound. It says that the kinetic energy of a particle will rise if it is confined into a smaller and smaller area. As delta x gets smaller, the kinetic energy gets bigger. But for this energy to be on a scale which is useful to us, delta x must be really very small. And the quantitative size of this is defined, again, by Planck's constant. The constant of nature which defined to the scale at which quantum mechanical effects take place. Something to point out is that if k is bigger than 2mc squared, you can actually get a particle-antiparticle pair appearing. That is to say, if that your particle is compressed into a small enough area, it can result in the formation of a party-antiparticle pair. And this is the first time that we will see an overlap between relativity and quantum mechanics. Now, where does this take us? Well, in a way, we can let Heisenberg meet Coulomb and consider what happens when we bring another form of energy into this equation. Let's look at the simplest atom there is, a hydrogen atom. Now we can write down the energy for this system. The energy will be the sum of the electromagnetic energy and the confinement energy. Now it's worth noting that the confinement energy for the proton will be much less than that for the electron because the mass of the proton is so much larger. And as we can see in the equation for the confinement energy, a larger mass results in a smaller confinement energy. So, let's write down the individual components of the energy of the system. The first one, the electric attraction between the positive nucleus and the negative electron, is as follows. V of R 
is equal to minus e squared upon 4 pi e naught r. And the second one, the Heisenberg energy, we could say, or the confinement energy. Either way, we'll call it e h is equal to h bar squared upon 2 m r squared. Now we can look at these graphically as well. Now what I've drawn here is the two individual energies, namely EH and VR, and their addition. The critical graph to look at is when you combine these two. This is EH plus VR. What this shows is the total energy of the system as a function of its radius. And the key thing you can see is that this energy reaches a minimum. Now our system will try to reach this minimum as well. And to find it, we need to differentiate. But first, let's write down the total energy of the system. So the total energy is merely the sum of the individual energies, or ET equals h bar squared over 2m r squared minus e squared upon 4 pi e naught r. Now we're going to differentiate this total energy with respect to the radius. So d e t by d r equals minus h bar squared upon m r cubed plus e squared upon 4 pi e naught r squared. Now what we're interested in here is the stationary value of this graph, and that is tantamount to saying when the gradient of this graph is equal to zero. So we want to know when this, dET by dr, is equal to zero. So let's set that equal to zero now. Now we can rearrange this and solve for r, and hopefully this will pop out as the Bohr radius. e squared upon 4 pi e naught r squared equals h bar squared upon m r cubed. And with one more line of algebra, we can get an equation out for r. r equals 4 pi e naught h bar squared upon m e squared. Now, this actually happens to be the exact equation for the Bohr radius of a hydrogen atom. But this is perhaps more of an accident by choosing the right scales than by using the actual correct physics. Let's make it clear, if we want to determine the Bohr radius precisely, we need to find the solutions to the Schrodinger equation. Now for a hydrogen atom, we can actually see what this is. And it turns out that for a hydrogen atom, the radius is approximately equal to 0.53 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video. Be sure to check out my other videos on the channel. Thank you. You've been listening to a Curious Scientist video. If you liked it, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so that you can get new videos just like this every week.